Hey everyone, Rizzo here, and welcome to the fourth installment of my season-wide Cold War Zombies review series. In today's episode, we'll be taking a look at the game's first DLC map, Firebase C. However, before diving into the map, there's a lot to catch up on in the world of Cold War Zombies, mainly because it took forever for me to actually make this, so let's speed through these real quick. With the launch of Firebase C, a reimagined form of Tombstone Soda was added to every zombie's experience in Cold War. As well as incorporating elements of who's who, it also retains its classic effect, where you leave a tombstone cache on death that you can pick up the following round. But unlike the Black Ops 2 iteration, there's actually a solid balancing factor in play. To pick up the tombstone, you'll have to trade every single point to your name. I've seen a significant amount of backlash to this change, but I think it's actually a very solid inclusion, as it gives some consequence to player death. In Green Run, you could just pick up the tombstone and continue on like nothing ever happened. But in Cold War, sure, you can get your loadout back, but since you have zero points, you still have to put in the effort to get 100% back on your feet and play very carefully until that happens. Shortly after Firebase C's release, a massive open-world sandbox mode called Outbreak was added to Cold War. The mode takes place on the game's Fireteam Dirty Bomb maps and features all sorts of neat weapons, mini-bosses, vehicles, easter eggs, objectives to complete, Orda encounters, and just recently, the mode's first main quest, complete with a surprisingly great final boss fight. I'm not going to turn this video into an Outbreak review, so I'm just going to say this for now. I've been wanting a big, dumb sandbox mode since I first started playing Zombies back in 2010, and this mode did not disappoint. Tier 4 and Tier 5 upgrades were added to every perk, wand, and weapon class in the game, allowing for even more ways to break the game's balance. A new ammo mod called Shatter Blast was added to the Pack-a-Punch machine and to Outbreak World Drops. This ammo type is primarily meant to help deal with the dreaded heavy zombies by creating a cluster explosion upon activation that stuns all basic enemies and shatters the armor of any zombie caught in the blast. Hence the name, Shatter Blast. It's a decent enough option, especially on Outbreak where every single enemy is a heavy zombie for some reason, but I would have preferred it if this ammo type only activated upon shooting an armored target. I can't tell you the amount of times I've been kiting up a horde only to have one little zombie get in my way, forcing me to shoot it and waste the Shatter Blast, and then have to wait another 40 seconds for it to charge back up. Two new wand field upgrades were added. Frenzied Guard, which acts like a beefed up version of the Now You See Me Gobblegum from Black Ops 3, and Toxic Growth, which I'm certain is only used by players that like to sit in AFK glitches. Speaking of wands, a nice quality of life change was made to them where the effect activates as soon as you press the button, rather than forcing you to wait on the animation. Treyarch actually addressed the problem I had with self-revives by making it so that every time you craft it, the price goes up by 50 rare salvage. I swear, someone at Treyarch watches these videos, because this isn't the first time one of my criticisms was addressed. Remember how I slammed the Tundra Gun when Todd Toten came out? It couldn't get one-hit kills past maybe round 35, and had no place in the map's Wonder Weapon meta. But shortly after that review went up, the Tundra Gun got silently buffed to one-shot kill at any round. There's also the whole fixing literally every single issue I had with Onslaught thing. It's just suspicious is all I'm saying. Unlock challenges were added to every single post-launch weapon in Zombies, so if you're a Zombies-only player that simply refused to play the multiplayer for the new weapons, worry not, you never have to touch multiplayer again. And the last of the global changes, the ones we've been asking for since the start of Season 1. All DLC weapons are now available in the Mystery Box rotation, and better yet, you can finally create custom mods and apply them mid-game. So basically, weapon kits are back, but you can change them up mid-match by selecting a different variant. It kind of kills that whole re-roll attachments feature offered by Ivan at the Armory, but I honestly don't care because this is a fantastic quality of life change, and I'm so glad Treyarch listened. On the Onslaught side of things, we got a few adjustments. Surges now take significantly longer to complete, and Super Sprinter Zombies were adjusted to begin spawning in earlier. This leads to a greater action to downtime ratio and much harder surges overall. Amidst the sea of positive additions, there is one bad change, and that's the changes made to high round zombie health. At launch, standard zombie health was capped at 30,000. However, after the May 18th update, it can now increase all the way to, I believe it's 120,000 at round 87. I get the idea here was to make high rounds a bit more challenging, and it's an idea that I agree with in theory because 30,000 was a bit low but the execution leaves so much to be desired. 
Because Cold War has been balanced around the 30,000 health cap until this point, many problems quickly popped up that should have been addressed early on. All wonder weapons become incredibly ineffective past round 40 because their damage values weren't adjusted properly, or at all. Melee weapons no longer one-hit kill at any round, making that entire weapon class kind of pointless. Most wand upgrades become a complete waste of time, leading to even less variety in that category. And the worst of all, the health cap is simply way too high when combined with the game's increases to zombie speed and damage output. Prior to this, if your reflexes were fast enough and you planned your moves accordingly, you could still kind of hold off zombies before they dealt too much damage to you. Now, their health can be so high that it doesn't matter how fast you are. Sometimes you're just fucked no matter what. Unless, of course, you camp with Ring of Fire. Woohoo. Now, because Treyarch has been surprisingly open to community feedback with Cold War, it's entirely possible that they continue to further adjust the health and damage values, and who knows? This might not even be a problem at all sometime in the near future. Oh, would you look at that? You know, all jokes aside, I gotta give Treyarch props for this. They easily could have buried their head in the sand and shouted, Nuh-uh, I'm right and all of you are the stupid ones. Like that whole no jug or pack a punch your gun five times nonsense from Black Ops 4. But they didn't. They made a change, saw community feedback, realized, okay, maybe there's some room for improvement, and decided to take another crack at it. Now, you could be a smartass and say, oh, well, they should have saw this coming and never made the mistake in the first place. First off, shut up. Second off, Unlike publishers, developers are human too, and they make mistakes just like you and I. Starting out with the good, we have the most important part of any standard zombies experience, map design. Like its predecessor, Firebase Z is a medium-sized map whose design focuses primarily on fast-paced, close-quarters engagements. And like D-Machina, upon turning on the power, many of the map's locked doors will open up and allow for each of these individual areas to flow into one another much more fluidly. But what if you're not a fan of super close quarters combat? Well, worry not. As was the case in D-Machina, there are exceptions for those that might not be comfortable with such close quarters. Last time, it was the plane crash. In Firebase Z, we have the downed helicopter. This area is much more wide open and welcoming than the rest of the map, but still not open enough to the point where literally nothing can threaten you. And unlike D-Machina, because this map commonly spawns enemies with special ranged abilities, this wide open space can actually be a bit of a double-edged sword, as there's nothing to quickly take cover behind if you're caught in the open. However, there's one aspect where this map completely trumps D-Machina, and that's its variety of holdout spots. Initially, I thought that Firebase Z didn't really have any good holdout spots, but that's just because I wasn't using my imagination. The bunkers in Scorched Defense, the roof next to the teleporter in the village, the inside of the OPC, the weapons lab, and of course, the colonel's office are all great spots to put your back to the wall with a couple of friends and hold out as long as you can. That's not really my preferred style of play, as I like to constantly run around like a madman, but for those of you that do enjoy the more sedentary playstyle, I think you'll find yourself quite happy with the amount of options you have. Many of these holdout spots are made even better by the map's wonder weapon, which feels like it was made specifically with this style of play in mind. Coming off the heels of D-Machina's rather lackluster die machines, Firebase Z introduces a brand new ray weapon, one that's quickly become one of my absolute favorites, the Ray K-84. Based on recovered schematics of Gurrod Krovi's Ray Gun Mark III, the Ray Gun fires high damage beams that can pierce through an entire horde of zombies, should you line the shots up properly. Mounted underneath is a special grenade launcher whose projectile damages and slows any enemy within a short range. However, like the Mark III before it, shooting it with the ray beams will overload it and cause a new effect. In Gorod, it opened a black hole that disintegrated anything it touched. In Firebase Z, the mine overloads and unleashes a devastating explosion that kills all standard zombies in range at any round. But what really makes the Ray K special is how interactive it is. A question that I brought up before when talking about my favorite wonder weapons is how interactive is it? Weapons like the Apothecon Servant, Thunder Gun, and Paralyzer are incredibly powerful, no doubt, but I don't really enjoy using them because I don't really feel like I'm doing anything. My skill doesn't really matter. I just pull the trigger once and everything dies. It looks cool, and like I said, it's effective as hell, but there's nothing really to it. The Ray K is the complete antithesis of this. You, the player, have to know how to properly use it to get the most out of it. Like the Mark II, 
You could just spray and pray like a madman, but to get the most out of it, you need to be actively lining up shots to pierce as many zombies as possible. As for the energy mine, a clever player can get a lot out of it by taking advantage of the fact that it goes through level geometry to make some ballsy ass plays. For example, you can detonate the mine on the second floor of a building and it'll kill any zombies directly underneath it on the first floor, giving you a brief window of opportunity to make your escape. So whether I feel like running and gunning or holding out in a corner, the Reike has me covered. It's versatile, satisfying to use, has plenty of player to enemy interaction, satisfying sound design, solid FX work, and a great visual design to boot. This weapon is, if you'll pardon the pun, simply wonderful. Moving on, we have an inclusion that slightly changes up the pace of a match. Every 10 rounds or so after re-enabling the facility's power, you'll be tasked with defending one of the three Aether generators around the map. During these assaults, dozens of zombies will rush in from the Dark Aether and attempt to shut down the generators much akin to the night rounds in Origins. But less shit. In fact, these rounds are actually quite fun. Each defense area has an equipment bench and a special terminal where you can buy a kill streak if you find yourself in desperate need of some additional fire support. But on your third defense round, the game decides to mix things up a bit and throws an additional problem at you first teased in the shadowy corners of Dean Machina. Your mom, a hulking monstrosity comprised entirely of human corpses, the Order will slowly approach the firebase and attempt to absorb the Ethereum reactor's energies. So it's on you to use everything you've learned thus far and every single tool at your disposal to put a stop to its advances. Huh, they just completely forgot to playtest this, huh? Part of me is disappointed that they so quickly pulled the curtain back on these giants, as it kind of ruins that unsettling aura they had when we knew nothing about them. But on the other hand, fighting a big fucking chungus in the middle of a zombies map is just so goddamn cool. Now it's easy to compare these Aether Assaults to some of the objective rounds in, let's say, Exo Zombies, but there's one big difference between those and the Assault Waves. The Exo Zombies objectives try to cram the objectives into the flow of a normal match without accounting for how it would destroy the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. The Aether Assault Waves, on the other hand, completely stop the normal gameplay flow and divert all the player's attention to the objective. All you have to do here is defend the reactors. This simplicity is why it works. It's intense without becoming overbearing. It's not like Carrier's Bomb Defusal, where you're given literally zero warning ahead of time. There's just a bomb with a really short timer all of a sudden, and it's on you to disarm it. The standard zombies gameplay remains unchanged, and they continue their assault as normal, but now you've got Atlas soldiers with ranged weapons thrown on top of it, and it just becomes a complete mess. Like, can you imagine how awful the Aether assault rounds would be if zombies kept spawning in normally in addition to the Aether portals, and you weren't given that 30 second timer to get ready? Holy shit, what a nightmare! <laughs> the last gameplay element I want to touch on is the map's new special enemies. Firebase Z opts to not recycle the Megatons, Myx, and Plaguehounds of D Machina, and instead features an entirely new assortment of special enemies to fight. The first and most unique of the bunch is this map's poster child, the Moishler. Uh, the Mimic. Treyarch really be out here asking Sledgehammer, hey, can I copy your homework? A monstrous amalgamation of several corrupted Omega Group workers, the Mimic can, as the name suggests, mimic the environment around it to camouflage itself. Whether this is done by taking the form of a common household item like a chair, an enticing piece of ground loot like a chopper gunner, or in incredibly rare situations, a perk machine, Mimics are meant to be slightly more intelligent than your average undead. But they don't just rely on this to do damage. If a player gets too close, the Mimic can either swipe at them with powers similar to a Megaton, or grab them with their creepy little tentacle things, and bite them. They also have a ranged attack to help deal with out-of-map glitches, where they'll spit an electric goo ball at the player. Stop that. The only problem I have with the Mimic is that like the Crimson Nosferatus from Dead of the Night, their bite attack is potentially devastating but sometimes it just bugs out, leading to the player taking absolutely no damage from the bite. I have no idea exactly why this happens, and believe me, I've tried to figure it out, but it just does sometimes, and it's kind of disappointing to see an enemy just not function sometimes, you know? The next special enemy on the docket is the Russian Mangler. I remember watching the trailer, and when I saw that Mangler, I instantly felt a pit in my stomach. These enemies were absolute garbage in Garrod Krovi, and I never wanted to see them again. So imagine my surprise when Treyarch not only managed to fix the thing I hated most about them, which was their cannon tracking, 
but actually make them threatening. They retain just about everything from their Garrod counterparts, but with one key exception. Their cannon shots no longer have absurdly high tracking, and you can stun them mid-charge up. That means that not only can you dodge a shot if you're fast, you're not going to get shot around corners anymore. I seriously cannot tell you how many times I died in Garrod because a mangler thought it would be funny to shoot me around a fucking 90 degree corner. Seriously, look at this nonsense! To compensate, the Firebase Z manglers are much tougher to kill than their paper mache counterparts from Black Ops 3, which I think is a solid trade-off. And if Treyarch wants to bring more of Aether's special enemies back like this, I'm 100% down. Personally, I'd like to see the Margwas again, especially since we were robbed of their return in Black Ops 4. Now, one could argue that these special enemies can drain your ammo real quick due to the relatively high spawn rates. But Treyarch must have thought of that too, because all special enemies in Firebase C will drop an ammo clip or two on death, meaning that the ammo you just spent killing the enemy is almost always instantly replenished. It just becomes a matter of, can you and your team hold them off? So, while Mimics and Manglers are indeed powerful and sound kinda broken on paper, their power is tempered by very obvious weak points and a balanced health pool. Like the Megatons, Blightfathers, and Margwas, I feel that these are very well-balanced enemies that actually add to the map's gameplay flow, rather than detract from it, like some of the mode's more... problematic special enemies. Yes, I'm talking about Thrashers. And rounding out the map's cast of creepy critters are the Hellhounds. Replacing the Plaguehounds of Dean Machina and their infuriating lunge attack, Aether's classic Hellhounds make a return, but with a different function. They no longer physically attack the player, and instead focus on suicide bombing them. When they explode, whether it be of their own volition or due to a player's attacks, they'll leave behind a pool of burning napalm that, like a Plaguehound's gas, damages anything that comes in contact with it, be it player or zombie. I honestly don't really have much to say about them. They are completely fine additions. The last thing I want to discuss before moving on from gameplay is the map's main quest and Firebase Z's continued focus on player accessibility. Like D Machina, this quest is significantly more handholdy than previous Zombies quests, which has been cause for some community pushback, but I personally don't see this as a bad thing. According to an interview with Treyarch published around the time of Outbreak's release, they stated that this was an intentional decision because almost nobody outside of YouTube or Reddit actually ever completed these things. So naturally, because most critical story information was hidden behind these quests, many casual players who might not even use YouTube or Reddit felt super confused as to what the hell was even going on. For as much as I love Blundell's run on zombies, it wasn't exactly new player friendly. With the gameplay out of the way, let's discuss the map's story, characters, and general presentation. An issue that some had with D Machina is how toned back its approach was compared to more recent Zombies endeavors. Aside from the quest spectral reflections, the resurrection of Orlov, and the occasional comment from your commander, D Machina was a fairly lonely affair. There weren't any boss fights or a massive outro cutscene or anything like that. It was just you, an abandoned Nazi facility, and a bunch of zombies. Personally, I feel like the more toned back, lonely approach to D Machina was intentional. That map felt very much like a return to the classic formula that Treyarch Zombies had kind of forgotten about. A map where you're not constantly bombarded with exposition or quests from all sorts of side characters. Firebase Z, on the other hand, is a much more action-heavy, narrative-driven experience that sees Requiem working alongside Omega Defector Ravenov to save Samantha Maxis. Along the way, they face resistance from constant dark aether breaches and the only other surviving member of Outpost 25, Dr. William Peck. It feels like with this map, Treyarch is slowly easing a new audience into the more cinematic, story-based approach that fans of the Blundell era are more familiar with, and I wouldn't be surprised if the next round-based map brings us even closer to that style. If we ever actually get one, that is. Another criticism of D Machina was its lack of interesting characters. While I personally didn't really mind that and was able to accept the map on its own terms, I absolutely understand where other people were coming from. Firebase Z addresses this critique as well by introducing two new key characters, the first of which is Sergei Ravanov, an Omega Sergeant turned double agent after witnessing the inhumane work of Omega firsthand. He provides Requiem with key information regarding the group and the inner workings of Outpost 25. The other is our first actual villain in the story, William Peck. A former scientist for the United States government, Peck defected to the Omega Group after being repeatedly passed on for promotion due to his extreme arrogance and borderline sociopathic personality. His time with Omega has not softened these rough edges though. 
as he constantly harasses and berates Requiem throughout the map's quest. You're still here? Why? I have no further use for you. You've done what I asked, now scram! Skedaddle! Don't make me grab the bug spray. God, I love Peck. He radiates such an intensely smug, chaotic evil kind of energy that I cannot get enough of in my villains. Kind of like Peter Straub from Nazi Zombies, but turned up to 11. Peck is the absolute worst, but goddammit he's the best at it. While Peck is easily the most entertaining character of the Dark Aether story thus far, there's one more that surprised me for completely different reasons, and that is Samantha Maxis. Craig Houston stated before launch that one of his goals with Firebase Z was to explore the character of Samantha in a way we really haven't gotten the chance to before. And like embracing the fun side of zombies with D Machina, this is a goal they met and then some. Finally, after so many flops, Treyarch has a strong, capable female lead. They managed to make Samantha strong, but unlike Scarlet Rhodes, their previous attempt at a strong female lead, it's done in a believable way. Despite Samantha's complete lack of fear in the face of her Russian captors and the tortures of the human world, we're shown something very important, and that is that she can be broken. This is something I feel that a lot of Call of Duty just gets wrong. Many of this franchise's characters, be it campaign or zombies or what have you, undergo the most traumatic shit imaginable, and yet they continue on like nothing happened. Yeah, yeah, I know, Call of Duty Zombies isn't exactly the place for frighteningly realistic takes on post-traumatic stress disorder, but let me dream, okay? Although Samantha starts out as a very strong, capable lead, throughout her time in the Dark Aether, she slowly begins to break down. She becomes an unhinged, violent soul that hides in the shadows of the Aether. And on one particularly bad occasion, she suffers a blackout, completely loses control, and slaughters an entire squad of Omega soldiers with only a knife, using it to rip into their corpses long after their deaths. When she finally snaps out of it, she just sits there alone and afraid, surrounded by the remnants of her rampage, and wanting nothing more than to go home. And what's really interesting is that much of this change wasn't just brought on by the Aether, much of it stems from one specific seed of doubt that realistically blossoms into a complete mental break. Right before Dr. Peck tosses her into the Dark Aether portal, he berates her, calling her worthless and assuring her that no one has or will come to help her because no one in the world actually cares for her. She's just an asset to Requiem, nothing more. Of course, Maxis doesn't pay this any mind when she first arrives in the Dark Aether, but as was established in D Machina, Time flows much differently here, so as her days turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months, those final words from our world start to become her truth. They poison her mind, and she begins to doubt herself, doubts whether anyone back home actually cared for her, doubts whether she's even worth coming back for, doubts whether she really is a good soul. With all that said, the next time we see her, she seems like she's back to her old self, which is something I've seen a lot of people take issue with, and on release, yeah, I was right there alongside those people. But with the introduction of Outbreak, and technically this might be cheating since this was released only recently and isn't a part of Firebase Z, but there's one specific piece of intel that led me down a road of infinite headcanons. In this intel, Samantha states that despite her anger at Weaver for keeping her confined under Requiem Lock and Key, there's a part of her that thanks him, because in truth, she's scared to go back into the fight. And this is why I think there's more to it than what first appears on the surface. Hear me out, by contextualizing the intel of Outbreak and the map's easter egg song Lost, we get an even clearer look at the character. Because Lost is written from the perspective of Samantha, the listener is able to gleam what the map's intel and Outbreaks have already kind of hinted at, that she has been broken by the Dark Aether. It changed her, made her into a much more violent person, one that doesn't always have control. What the intel doesn't tell us is that now she has this internal struggle. She feels afraid of showing this changed person to those who knew her. So when Requiem finally extracts her from the dimension, she puts up that front again like nothing ever happened. A slightly brash, yet tough front that, in the outro, her friend Ravanov appears to see right through. There's nothing so broken that it cannot be fixed. Maybe I'm reading a bit too much into it and seeing what I want to see, as I'm known to do on occasion, but the way I interpret this line is that Ravanov is speaking to the hurt little girl underneath that rough exterior. Without directly confronting Samantha and forcing her to deal with that pain before she's ready, 
he's reassuring her that even though she may feel lost, scared, and broken right now, there will be a time where she won't feel like this. Everything will be set right, and someday, maybe not today, or tomorrow, but someday, things will be better. I haven't included this segment in quite a while, but there's so much that I like about this map that not all of it can fit into or be given its own specific segment. If I did that, we'd be here for hours. For starters, the map has a new set of wall weapons. Rather than just recycle De Machina's selection and call it a day, many fan favorites make the way into the wall selection. The AUG, Spaz-12 again, AK-47, Stoner-63, and one that I really love but I know everyone else hates, the FFAR. Oh, yeah, the M82 is here, I guess. There's now multiple locations for Ivan's armory station. I didn't even consider the singular location to be a problem in D-Machina, and I still don't, but now, I can't imagine future maps without this change. It seems as though the Wonder Fizz is gonna be a season constant after all. The Hellhounds actually have a brand new model for the first time in six years. Much of the map, particularly the village area, is comprised of reused campaign geometry. Some may see this as a negative, but I personally really love when they do this. I find it much akin to the charm of World at War and World War II. For example, Nocturne on Toten and Verrucht. Those entire maps are just repurposed from the multiplayer maps Airfield and Asylum respectively. But even though they're technically the same thing again, you end up with a completely new experience. Or when World War II brought Grossenhaus over to multiplayer. Same geo and layout, but a completely new way to play. I don't know, maybe I'm just easy to please, but to me, it's really charming to see a different spin put on locations that I'm already familiar with. The map's easter egg song, Lost. While I really enjoyed D Machina's Alone, and that's easily Clark Nova's best zombie song, Lost hits different. I love Kevin's rock songs, but the ones that I really adore are the more slow, beautiful ones like Where Are We Going, Always Running, and the theatrical mixes of Archangel and The Gift. What's really special about Lost is that not only is it written by lead writer Craig Houston, but it's actually sung from the point of view of Samantha Maxis by her voice actress Julie Nathanson. Maybe it's the fact that we've been following this character for over a decade, or maybe it's just Nathanson's beautiful singing voice. But, I don't know, something about this one just hits different. On the topic of Samantha, can we talk about her scavenger design for a minute? Not only does it not so subtly remind us of the old era of Aether through some choice accessories, but it's the textbook definition of a DeviantArt OC. Think about it. We've got the edgy skull on her shoulder pad, she has a sweet freaking katana, badass facial scars, and the cherry on top, ethereum tainted eyes that glow purple. And I am fucking here for all of it. OC or not, this design rocks. And my absolute favorite little thing in the entire map, the Game Over laugh is back. It's been absent from every single map's Game Over song since Mob of the Dead started the trend back in 2013, which is the worst thing about that map. That's eight years of not hearing this, for lack of a better term, iconic sound effect. I'm usually pretty straight-faced and stoic when playing these new maps, but when I ended my first match and I heard that laugh, I genuinely felt like the critic in Ratatouille. You know, Treyarch, you didn't have to add that, but you did, and I love it. It really is the little things, man. So there's a lot to love about Firebase Z, but even with masterpieces like Mob of the Dead and Der Eisendrock, it's still not perfect. So let's get started. I mentioned earlier how I like the map's new characters, but I still can't help but wish that this had extended to our player. I've largely come to terms with the fact that we're probably not going to get a traditional crew of sorts in this game, and personally, this doesn't completely break the experience for me or anything like that. I mean, yes, I would have preferred it if they handled it like World War II where you had a canonical cast, but then there were these special non-canon characters you could play as if you wanted to, but hey, can't get everything we want, right? Eh, they fixed Onslaught, that's more than enough for me. The complete lack of Dark Aether. One of the coolest parts of D Machina was being able to teleport to the Dark Aether and see how it mirrored our world. It was beautiful to look at, but there was something off about it that was creepy as hell. It gave the experience its own unique charm that hadn't really appeared in Zombies at this point. In Funny Base Z, there's not a single canonical instance of traveling to the Swag Aether. Instead, the only time we get a glimpse of the Dark Hour is during the Loot Chest side quest. 
And it's not just a copy paste of Die Maschine either, it has its own unique approach. Instead of assaulting the player with colors and chromatic aberration, it's pitch black, with the only exceptions being the light emanating from the undead and the glow of the demonic bunny. It's weird and unsettling, which makes it all the more disappointing that they do nothing with it. D Machina showed immense potential for the Dark Aether, not only from a visual perspective, but a puzzle perspective as well. I was so excited to see what kind of neat easter eggs they'd come up with by utilizing the whole cracked mirror reality thing, and to see such potential completely dropped is a bit disappointing. Another element dropped from D Machina was the Ray Gun. Even though it hasn't really been all that useful until Cold War, the Ray Gun has always been a comforting constant throughout the Aether Saga, appearing in literally every single map. When things got weird in the Blundell era, the Ray Gun was right there alongside it. Same goes for the perk machines, power-ups, wall chocks, all that good stuff. They were comforting constants that helped us stay subconsciously connected to where it all began. Firebase Z marks the first Aether map in its 13-year run, where the Ray Gun doesn't make an appearance and it's honestly really jarring. I know they probably omitted it to give the Ray K more time to shine, and it's probably just the fanboy in me talking, but I feel like there are some things that are tradition for a reason, you know? Especially with how incredible this game's version of the Ray Gun is. It just feels... it feels wrong to not have it here. Thankfully though, Outbreak has rectified this sin, so it doesn't seem like the Ray Gun is going to be gone for long. I mentioned earlier how much I like the new special enemies, but there's one returning face that still kind of irks me. The heavy zombies. I don't mind the idea of a zombie with a bit of armored protection. In fact, I think the new type they introduced in this map, the light armor zombie, is a great middle ground. They have a bit of bullet resistance, but the armor doesn't cover their entire body and it breaks fairly easily under prolonged fire. For all of you old folk in the audience, remember the armored zombies in Die Rise? Yeah, it's kind of like that. These guys are totally fine. Heavy zombies, though, have massive resistance to all bullet-based weapons, and when you hit a piece of armor, it nullifies all multipliers associated with the weapon. So any weapon that relies heavily on headshots to deal damage like the Magnum or the entire sniper category are next to worthless against these guys. Sure, Shatter Blast helps a little bit, but that has a very lengthy 40-second cooldown and is more of a band-aid solution, if anything. I love a lot about Cold War Zombies, to the confusion of some, but you will never see me defending these guys. Except for their goofy little smile. Look at him! He's so happy! He knows he's making almost two entire weapon classes worthless. Now, let's move on to the main quest. I praised the accessibility of this earlier, but to say that it's flawless is far from the truth. In particular, there are two parts of the quest that irk me. The first, and honestly least annoying by comparison, is the Mimic Memory Step. This step requires you to capture and analyze the memories of what used to be Omega Group personnel to help save Maxis. And to a certain extent, capturing these little characters is actually kind of fun. The problem I have is that the conditions for success are stupidly specific. You can't just capture any old Mimic. You need to capture one that spawned from fake loot in one of the three areas of the map, but only once per round, and you need to weaken it considerably. But be careful, because if you happen to shoot them in the head, the memory will become corrupted, forcing you to burn around and try again. Now, once you actually know all this, this step comes as easy as your mom. But it's so weird that the rest of the map's quest is fairly simple and straightforward, but this step feels like something right out of old zombies, with how annoyingly specific it is. And secondly, we have the Final Order confrontation. To have a truly solid main quest that sticks with the player long after its completion, you need to cap it off with a great finale. Whether it's a mind-blowing event like the destruction of the Earth and Moon, or a massive boss fight, these are the quests that stick with people. The Corrupted Keeper of Derizendraka, the Beast from Beyond's Mephistopheles, and the God King of Thule are all fantastic examples of this. Even though some of the quest steps in those maps were a bit annoying, or in some cases downright infuriating, those bosses and the satisfaction that came with a long hard-fought victory really stick with you. Unfortunately, Firebase Z's finale is not just underwhelming, but actively bad. Just as Requiem saves Maxis, an Orda emerges from the ground in the village, completely blocking any hope of escape. This sets the stage for a desperate final push. Or you could just do this again. They still haven't fixed this, huh? Okay, broken weapons aside, like the final battle for Agartha, 
There's next to no threat from the boss itself, and the fight is over in under a minute without any real effort. That last part is particularly vexing. There is so much cover in the village, and the Order's actual attacks are so inconsequential, that even the worst of the worst zombies player should have no trouble beating this. So while I felt that the quest itself was decent, the final battle left me with an overwhelming feeling of, wait, that's it? And that, sadly, poisons the entire quest a bit. Before we wrap up here, let's take a quick look at some nitpicks I picked up on while playing. I omitted this section from my D Machina review because I didn't think anyone actually cared about it, which, judging by the comments on that video, I now recognize was a huge mistake. I really underestimated how much you all actually enjoyed this segment. So here we go. On the aerial reconnaissance photographs of the Omega facility, they forgot to disable the crosshair when taking in-game screenshots. The Omega soldiers in the outro are holding the American-made M16 which is bad enough on its own, but they're lacking a magazine model, and they forgot to hide the tag for the optical rail mesh. Another issue with this outro is the botch reveal of Kravchenko. Cinematically, it's well done, but Treyarch made one little mistake. They name drop him in the subtitles before the shot pans up. So the first time I saw this ending, the impact of his reveal was completely negated because I read the subtitles and said, oh, I guess this guy's Kravchenko. Oh, yep, yeah, he is. This has literally zero effect on the map, but does Samantha's scavenger model really have to have 104 materials? Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm technically not supposed to be extracting assets in the first place, and do most of them really need to be micro detail materials too? I just needed to get that one out of my system. On a desk in the planning office, you can see that someone forgot to make this cloth tear transparent. Mimics can occasionally spawn in with a second head model that clips through itself. And last, but certainly not least, why did you get rid of the woo sound the hellhounds used to make? In conclusion, Firebase Z takes everything, well, almost everything, that made Deem Machina great and builds on it. The map design is strong and conducive to the new special enemies, which are quite solid in their own right. There's some unexpected turns for the character and story of Dark Aether, and lastly, the main quest is nice and simple, finally allowing Zombies to open itself and the world up to a much wider audience instead of being made strictly for us YouTube weirdos. Really, the only negatives I can list are Heavy Zombies still kinda suck, the final boss is super disappointing, and I guess that Mimic step in the quest is kinda silly? You know, on one hand, it's refreshing to love a map this much, but on the other, it makes reviewing them a bit tougher since I like to try and look at things from a more balanced perspective if I can. But throwing aside professionalism for just a moment, I know this map isn't perfect. But, god damn, I just... I really love it. What's that feeling? Is that... happiness? <laughs> oh, I don't like that at all. Well, that's all for today. I know this one, like D Machina, was a bit delayed to put it lightly. But, I'll level with you. I really haven't been feeling YouTube most days for some reason, and I've been spending most of my free time lately just playing other games. Sure, I've been keeping up with zombies and enjoying the hell out of it, but aside from the occasional stream or a session with friends, most of my gaming time has been spent playing through the Persona games, which is entirely Nick's fault for introducing me to Royal. I know life the absolute shit out of 5 and 4, and then immediately jumped into 3 like, hey, those last two were fun, this one has to be fun too, right? Oh. Oh no. Oh no, this one is depressing as shit, and also my new favorite game of all time. Hey, and the film adaptations are super good too? Huh. Wicked. So, despite the delays, I really hope you enjoyed watching. As for future reviews, I think I'm gonna review maps a lot later in their life cycle like Firebase C, so that I can really have time to absorb these things and form a solid, informed opinion on them. And as for Outbreak, I have no plans to review it for the time being. The reason for that being this comment right here. It brings up a very good point I hadn't considered before. Because Cold War is a live service game, much to my chagrin, it's more than likely that Outbreak is going to continue getting adjustments to its balance, additional maps, and objectives, and so on. So I think it'd be better to wait until at least the end of Cold War's first year of content to properly cover it. This kind of extends to Onslaught as well, but the changes there were so massive that my original review was completely outdated, and I felt it was only fair to reward such hard work with more accurate coverage. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.
save me, you 